Good evening, my name is John Milburn and this is Laws 11062. This is Contract B and we're into week three of the material. Thank you very much for joining us for the live session. And as always, I'm recording this session to upload. If you're watching this as a recorded session, I do urge you to attend live if you can. I understand that everyone is busy and uh, as university students, you may well have other subjects units that um, clash in terms of timetable. But if you are available, please attend. I'm going to be honest and say that I'm just a little concerned about one aspect of what we're doing this term. And that is, as I mentioned in week one, I'm very keen on this collaborative approach being adopted. And I'm not sure there's been a lot of interaction between students. Now, I might be wrong. But as I threatened I might do, I think last week or the, on the, in the first week, I may hand things over to you next week. And that's probably what I'll do. Now, what that would mean in practical terms is this. Join as scheduled. Um, I'll be in the background, um, but I want you to take the lead. Now, those of you that are on top of the unit, doing well, undertaking the reading, maybe getting some ideas about how to approach the first assessment, may feel confident enough to take the lead. Now, by that I mean you don't have to take the lead for the entire time, but you may feel comfortable in leading some discussions. Now, the reason I'm doing this, as I've done sometimes in the past, is, and only for first year students really, is to generate some ability that you feel that you can take ownership of your studies. I mentioned the flipped classroom model, and this is a great opportunity to put it into practice. So um, if, and I expect I will do this, that happens next week, I'll ensure that I record what I would normally say in the live session. So you'll have that opportunity. Uh, if you can't make it to the live session next week, I'm sorry you will miss out because it's, I'm not going to record it if I'm handing it over to you, but you'll at least have the benefit of what I normally do um, in these sessions in any event. Now, I hope that's not putting too much pressure on you. It's not meant to. It's meant to encourage you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns about that proposed course of action? All good? All right. We'll take that as a Yes, thank you, John, for allowing us that opportunity. We will embrace it. Is that a good response? Thank you. Um, and of course, I'm just looking at the level of activity on Moodle, and it is a little low. I'd like to see some more activity. We're getting some, but we're not getting a lot of replies to emails. In fact, the only replies that I can see are from me. Now, it, I know there's a dynamic. If I say something in response to a question, it seems to shut down the conversation. And that's not meant to be the case. I'll just tell you a story. When I um, first started in law, I went straight from school to university. No gap year, none of that. And for me, um, I had very little world knowledge. I mean, I didn't even know what a mortgage was. Um, but I had the benefit of engaging with some of the mature students who were very good and very capable. And I asked one of them, who was actually one of my teachers at one stage at school, I said, why don't you go to the lectures? Because, you know, I was the sort that would sit in the front row and put my hand up and attend everything. And I never missed any lectures or tutorials ever in the seven years I was at uni. And he said, well, I can read the textbook as intelligently as the lecturer. And that really floored me and impressed me as a response. Now, I'm not suggesting that by that response, I'm saying, don't turn up. I really do want you to, but in a slightly different capacity where it's more interactive. So the point that I'm making is this. If there's a question raised on Moodle or elsewhere, don't just think that because I provide a response, that should be the end of the discussion. Quite the opposite. And the same goes for the weekly problems. Those of you that have been providing answers to the weekly problems or your contribution, Thank you so much, double thumbs up. I've been quiet because I want to encourage that interaction between you. Again, if you're in bricks and mortar, you meet people in the hallway, it's a little different. 
but in first year, you kind of need to work at it a bit. And I really have a sense that the cohort that we have here um, includes a lot of excellent talent. So let's see that come through. Now, one of the downsides, if you like, to the flipped classroom model that's adopted at this university is that we rely on you to undertake some important key reading. Um, and one of those that I want to ensure that you read is my sample document. And I'm saying my sample document, I, I'm not sure if my name's on it, but it's certainly one that I created and it's on Moodle. Um, does, does everyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about the sample document? It's um, just a, a Word document that provides some useful hints on how to write material, how to set it out, footnote referencing, things of that nature. If we look at getting started, useful research links, it's probably there. It'll be there somewhere. Um, so please have a look at that and ensure that you follow those basic rules. Uh, there it is, it's under the first assessment. So it's part of exemplar, Exemplar's further assistance with the assessment. So written assessment guide and written assessment guide sample document are the ones that I'm referring to. So you'll see from that that I promote some styles of writing, short sentences, avoid legalese, and I want you to have a good idea of how to use the Word program. Most of you, I suspect, will use Word when you produce your document. If you're not Google Docs, whatever you're using, but make sure that you know how to use some of the basic skills and do it well. Um, you need to know the styles function that's built into Word. You need to ensure that you know how to create a superscript footnote reference automatically. Don't type it manually. Um, I will mark you down for that. Understand that presentation is important. <clears throat> when I look at a document, I can't help but look at the, um, uh, I, I can't help but look at the way in which it's presented. And if you present something that has a professional, consistent look about it, then odds are immediately, I like your work. And that's a good starting point, as opposed to something which is in different fonts, different sizes, erratic spacing, no use of proper footnote referencing, um, and the list goes on. And with the feedback that I provide you for the assessment, I'm going to assume that you've read the sample document and you've got a good idea of how to set things out. Now, one thing that you could consider for next week is just one thing, is if you've got a good template, a good a way of setting things out, bring it along. It's a show and tell and say, look, here's what I've got. It's a skeleton that works for me that I've developed for answering legal problems. And I like it because it prompts me to do certain things. It allows me to introduce certain material um, in, a, in a professional way. I've talked about a toolkit previously, and by that I mean your guide as to how to include things. And the toolkit should include some assumptions. Now, when you're answering a legal problem, the next thing is this, make sure it's consistent, but then identify any assumptions that you might actually be making. I'll give you a very quick example. You're asked to consider the remedies that might be available to A as a result of a breach of the contract by B. That's all I'll tell you at this stage. Before you start to write the answer, can you identify any assumptions that you might be subconsciously making about that factual scenario? Anyone want to come up with some ideas, try and understand what I'm getting at here? A and B have a dispute. One of them needs to seek, one seeks a remedy. Are there any assumptions that you might make? I'm looking at the chat facility. No, nothing yet. I'll get you started. Now, when you when I mentioned that topic, were you thinking that it was a, an oral contract 
or a written contract? What was your assumption? Or didn't you have one? I'll get you to type it in or unmute the microphone. Did you assume something or another? Oral or written or didn't think about it or it doesn't matter? No assumptions made, okay? So, and that's fine. And Gary says remedy should be applied to complete contracts, all right? But of course you can have oral contracts and written contracts, can't you? That are both, that are legally, depending on the relationship. So, so that's maybe one thing, if you think of um, an assumption. The next thing is this, did you assume that the contract was one that was entered into in Queensland? Yes, no, or didn't think about it? So we're getting some answers. Yes, thought it was in Queensland. Next assumption. Did you assume that we were talking about a contract that was entered into recently? As in the last, I don't know, month, two months, six months? Or didn't you think about when the contract was entered into? So we're getting some answers, yes. As in thought it was recent. And some questions, principles should apply across the board, shouldn't they? Good question, but I'll raise some concerns about why this might make a difference. Did you assume that the parties A and B were adults? You probably did. Um, so here's why I'm asking you to think about these assumptions and be conscious that you may need to introduce this. And you should certainly have this in your toolkit. Contract, you know, are you assuming? Bing, 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 bing. Number one, if the contract wasn't in Queensland and you start to tell me about the Property Law Act of Queensland 1974, you know, cross, cross, not relevant to this problem. If the contract that you're referring to was made 10 years ago, and it's subject to the statute of limitations, which provides that you must sue on that contract within six years, otherwise you may not have the opportunity to obtain a remedy, then there is no remedy available to you. So does the statute of limitations apply? Is the contract one that is for the supply of necessary items, which would allow a child to be bound by it? Um, things, capacity, things of that nature. So I'm not saying that you need to worry about each of these things on every occasion. But the point that I'm trying to make and labouring over it a bit is think about these assumptions that you might make, have a checklist, have some document you can refer to. And if you're really stuck for something to say, you can always bring that in as part of a discussion point. I hope you get the idea. Are there any questions about what I'm trying to convey here all good all right now there's been some questions about the aglc4 and um, of course the aglc4 isn't tied to the word program so when you use your footnote referencing tool in word it will allow you an opportunity to populate the footnote but it won't actually tell you what to put in there so that's when you'd need to go to AGLC4. Does that, does that answer your question, Gary, from a little while ago? Yeah, it, it does, John. I, I, in previous modules, I've been able to incorporate uh, uh, 3.0, but 4 is just inconsistent. You can, you can use it for a while, but when you close the document and everything like that, Mind you, I'm using Apple Mac as well. It won't save it. You've got to continually go back and uh, reincorporate it. It's, it's a pretty long process. Okay. Uh, not even the university library has been able to sort the problem. Oh, okay. um, so basic, basically, rather than go through a whole procedure, which is probably not worthwhile, um, I just keep the, the uh, AD4 um, 
guideline document with me when I'm yeah. actually doing footnotes and assessments. Yeah, all right. Sorry, I can't help with that technical issue using a PC rather than a Mac. Um, there are going to be those sort of issues. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or are we all good? All right. So when you're preparing your letter, uh, your um, answer, be conscious of material facts as well and think about those assumptions that you might make. Another thing you might consider is calling for or making a note of missing critical information. So um, in suitable cases, you might state the assumption, assuming the contract was made in Queensland, my advice is X, Y, Z. That's if you, ha you don't have to do that, but it's a nice touch. And of course, the question that is provided to you in an examination style situation uh, is likely to have some information that may be missing or confusing, either intentionally or otherwise, if you understand what I'm getting at. All right, so make sure that you've got a template that works for you and use that for your first assessment and make it such that you can use it into the future as well. Make sure that you are able to cite your material in accordance with the AGLC4. And remember, of course, the difference in basic terms between common law and equity, um, because sometimes the remedies that are available to you may depend upon which of the regimes you're considering and which principles you're applying. If you haven't um, brushed up on your distinction between common law and equity recently, perhaps do that. And if you've got any questions, um, you know, bring them along next week because colleagues might have some great answers or ask through Q&A. Now, we were talking about mistake, um, just some comments about now misrepresentation and misleading and deceptive conduct. Chapter 13 of your textbook and mistake deals with issues before or at the time of contract, doesn't it? But misrepresentation and misleading and deceptive conduct conduct also apply before or at the time of contract. So sometimes the timing of that which you're considering within the context of an answer may have a bearing on the answer that you provide. Terms are the obligations that are contained within a contract and representations that are made before the contract are signed pre-contractual statements, they're usually not enforceable obligations under the contract. So keep that in mind that it may have some remedy that's available to you, but it may not be part of the contract. So when you're undertaking your study, you need to consider the difference between mistake and misrepresentation and mistake and misleading and deceptive conduct. And generally, there are different places in our law that you look to, to argue these different um, concepts and potential remedies that might be available. So when we talk about misleading and deceptive conduct, is there a statutory provision that immediately comes to your mind as being that's the one that's likely to apply in a contract dispute? Yes, Bothwell's got it, the ACL. Um, out of interest, where do you find the ACL in the statute books? ACL section 18, says Sharon. Yes. Where do you find the ACL? Do you know? I'll give you a hint. It's a schedule to some legislation. Have a look for it. Um, one of the tasks for the week might be to do that. The other, another thing you might want to consider in the session next week is, look, what have you found really useful in terms of a resource for research? We talked about LexisNexis versus Westlaw, all of those things, you know, some show and tell. Um, bring along some information that might help and uh, that you might want to share with your colleagues. Now, when it comes to misrepresentation at common law, four elements must be present. Number one, there must be a false statement. But that false statement 
must be of something that was in the past or the present. In other words, you can't have a common law misrepresentation in relation to a false statement of the future. So a false statement at common law is something in the past, something in the present, which includes that element of misrepresentation. Um, and you've got to contrast that with other possible interpretations of that which was said. For example, a mere opinion or a statement of law or puffery. You know, when we see an ad, you know, this is the world's best, I don't know, milkshake maker. Um, we just take that with a grain of salt, don't we? You know, they're just puffing about their product or mere silence. So there has to be a statement at common law. So generally, those other things, such as silence, won't cut it in terms of being the first aspect of misrepresentation. Again, I go back to these checklists, um, which make it easy for you under pressure to look at the facts, identify the material facts, then look at the checklist to say, does it fit? Does this round square, does this round object fit within this square um, object over here? They may not match, if you know what I mean. Number two, at common law, the misrepresentation must be something which is a statement, which is false, and it must be addressed to the other party. In other words, for it to be a misrepresentation, there has to be an inducement to enter into the contract and not some third party. Number three, it must be at the time when the contract was made. And number four, it must be intended to and did in, did in fact induce the representee to make the contract. So the key elements there, past or present fact, not a statement about things as they will be in the future at common law. Understand those basic rules, have them documented. And when you're preparing your notes or your check, whatever it might be, um, have some reference to re relevant legislation or case law. If it's common law, odds are it'll be case law that you're referring to as your authority for each of these propositions. If you're in court, you'll be used to a court saying, well, that's all very interesting, but what's your authority for that proposition? So the court saying, what's the case that's relevant to what you're saying is the position of law? Now in misrepresentation, there are three categories of misrepresentation. And one of them is um, Derry and Peake um, was the, the leading case in this. Innocent misrepresentation, fraudulent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, all matters that were considered in that decision. Derry and Peak, 1889, 14 appeal case, 337. Now you've noticed that I've said Derry and Peak. In your second assessment, don't argue a case and refer to it as Derry, Derry v Peak. That's not what we do. Have you, you've picked up on that? So even though it says the V, don't say V, don't say versus. What, well, I don't know why lawyers do this, but we do it. This is what we do. The case is Derry and Peak. It's not Derry v Peak. It's not Derry versus Peak. And you'll find it consistently. Um, Hadley and Baxendale, you know, um, whatever it might be. Um, so, and. Now, misrepre misrepresentation is referred to in Derry and Peak, but it's also as quite rightly identified, I think by Sharon earlier, that the key piece of legislation here is the Australian Consumer Law Section 18. That's the most important provision for you to consider within this context of statutory misleading or deceptive conduct. And there was a very good question in Q&A as to the wording, why it was different in the text compared to the legislation. Um, because bear in mind that Section 18 is a flow on, it's a replacement to the old Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act. So please, please, please don't argue anything under the Trade Practices Act. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now the ACL. We're all clear on that. That's good. All right. 
So section 18 prohibits by statute, misleading or deceptive conduct. Once again, you've got the advantage of some excellent notes in this unit. I really like the flow charts. They really should help you. And um, now the question is, the second assessment is a video. Yes, but isn't it a video where you have to argue some legal propositions? And if you're arguing some legal propositions, what that means is that you'll have to refer to some cases, presumably. Uh, so it's in that context. Now, fraudulent, innocent misrepresentation occurs when someone had no idea that what they were saying was wrong and therefore no intention of failing to tell the truth. But it's still actionable in some circumstances. Fraudulent mis misrepresentation, which is also a tort. People are studying torts or have studied torts. Okay, so you'll be aware that when I talk about a tort, T-O-R-T, I'm not talking about a cake, I'm talking about a different area of practice and law. So fraudulent mis misrepresentation is also a tort. It occurs in four conditions. When a party knowingly makes the untrue statement, when the party unknowingly, or sorry, knowingly, makes a partial statement, which may be true, but which has the effect of conveying something that's false. Um, for example, if you stated, I have this, I've had this inspected, when in fact what you've had is the car's paperwork inspected, not the car itself. You know, it's sort of it's a half truth intended to deceive that can be fraudulent. And when the party makes a statement um, which may or may not be true, without caring whether it's true or not, you know, recklessness can become fraudulent misrepresentation. You didn't know it was untrue, but you didn't care. You just said it anyway, you know? Um, and, that's, and that's where they get a lot of these people on charges of, well, what you've sold, you know, this um, product, which you say will cure this disease. I mean, you've got no basis for saying it. Um, so therefore it's fraud. And when a party actually makes a statement with no belief at all in the truth, so do have a look at Dairy and Peak. Be aware of what's involved in it. Consider that within the context of Section 18 and try to fit them in together. Now, negligent misrepresentation is also a tort. It has three elements involved in it. There must be some sort of duty. The defendant must fail to comply or meet that duty. And there must be some harm arising from the failure. In other words, loss or damage caused by the breach. So what are the key words? There are three elements, but four key words. The key words are a duty, a failure, a loss, and a causation. Sometimes people forget about the loss and causation. It's not enough to show you've had a loss. You need to attribute the loss to the um, cause in that situation. What we call that causation. And that's part of the emphasis of the unit where I keep talking about remedies and what can we do about this thing. So one party needs to be under a duty to obtain and tell the truth, not just a courtesy, but an actual legal duty. And that's not always easy to identify. We're not talking about courtesy, or even ethics or good business practice, there has to be an actual legal duty. Now, the person has to then fail in that duty um, by making a statement that is a misrepresentation and the other party must cause a loss, be, suffer a loss, and that must be attributed to the statement. Now, can anyone tell me the name of the leading case that deals with these issues in relation to duty, failure, loss, causation, negligent misrepresentation at common law. What's the leading case, the case you really must put into your assessment answer and deal with any problem solving? Anyone? Ferris Bueller moment. No? 
All right. Have a look at Headley, Byrne and Heller. Ah, Sheree, I just, I just beat you to the punch, didn't I? But I'm sure you were typing it just as I was saying it. So you correct there, it is Headley, Byrne. So have a look at Headley, Byrne and Heller. And the citation is Headley, Byrne and Co. Limited v, I can say it in that context, Heller and Partners Limited, 1964 AC 465, but more commonly known as Headley, Byrne and Heller. So what happened in that case? Um, in that instance, Headley, Byrne were advertising agents. They obtained a new client called Easy Power. And before extending credit to that new client, Headley Byrne sought information from the client's bank, Heller, um, Heller and Partners Limited. And um, Heller gave it an appropriate assurance, but Easy Power then went into liquidation and Headley Byrne sued in tort and was successful in arguing that their economic loss had arisen as a result of a negligent misstatement made by Heller. So the court found that there were the three elements were in that case, there was a duty. It was what they, the court described as sufficiently proximate to create the duty of care. Heller would have known that Headley Byrne was likely to rely upon this assurance for about the information for entering into the contract. Failure, well, there was a failure, clear failure to provide accurate information and there was a loss because when um, the company went into liquidation, Easy Power, then um, Headley Byrne lost all its money. Now, another case a little closer to home is Shattuck and Parramatta City Council. This is 1981, 150 CLR 225. Shattuck bought a block of land, the solicitors did all the usual checks. Uh, council supplied a certificate, didn't actually state that no road widening proposals were planned, but was silent on the point. The purchase went ahead and then it was affected by this road widening proposal. Three elements, the duty of the council, the failure, the loss. Um, in that instance, the, um, the loss was clear um, because the owner could have negotiated something at a lesser price. So it's pretty broad, negligent misrepresentation at common law. So keep that in mind. So what are the, we know the key thoughts. It applies to past or present facts. And there are three, three categories, innocent, fraudulent, negligent, and you need to have each of those categorized in your mind so that when you're reading a problem, you can appropriately pigeonhole it into the right legal category. So generally, what are the re what are the remedies for misrepresentation? Anyone want to proffer an opinion? What are the remedies? Any thoughts? I'm asking you lots of difficult questions tonight. I know. Rescission and damages at common law. Thank you, Natalie. Excellent. Damages, are they available for innocent misrepresentation? No, Gail, very good. Thank you. Cherie says no as well. So watch out for exclusion clauses, misrepres misrepresentations. Um, while a party is usually bound by all the con contents of the signed written contract, even if they didn't read it, a clause is not legally enforceable if it misrepresents the effect of the clause to another. Um, so an exclusion from liability is not generally legally incorporated into a contract if there's been a misrepresentation contrary to the terms of that exclusion clause. Have a look at Curtis against Chemical Cleaning Company, 1951 KB 805. Now, Here's an important area, affirmation or rescission. Um, now, the, yes, um, the, you, Bridget asked the question, don't we need past or present 
was the question. Um, fact in negligence, a negligent misrepresentation, and not necessarily an opinion was also not always fact. That's a really good point because you're right, it needs to be a statement of a fact. However, it may look like an opinion, but it's also a statement of fact. So I guess you're really considering the Hedley Byrne and Heller situation. The thing that made that slightly different and put it into the category of fact rather than opinion is essentially that the recipient of the information is entitled to expect that the bank knew information and whilst it might be presented as an opinion, it's really a statement that is based on fact and it's actionable in that regard as well. I hope that provides some degree of clarity to, to what I think you're asking. Thank you. All right, so um, in terms of affirmation or rescission, once a party discovers the misrepresentation, the affected party may elect to either affirm, which means go ahead with the deal, despite the misrepresentation, or rescind the contract, which means effectively uh, terminating uh, the contract. Now, I've got to be careful with the wording here because rescission and, and termination are actually different things, but it has the effect of fin finalising the contract rescission. But you need to make a clear election. Now, if a party affirms the contract, that party can no longer rescind. And if the party rescinds, the party can no longer affirm. In other words, once the election is made, it can't be retracted. The case that you want to put in your toolkit to support that proposition is Sargent and ASL Developments. Another way of saying that is Sargent against ASL Developments. We can say that as well, just don't say V or versus. Um, 1974 131 CLR 634. Now the, the question of whether an election has been made is determined by a court in accordance with the objective or the subjective test. Now, to answer that, you probably need to know the difference. I think we talked about that, didn't we? What do you think? Objective or subjective test used by a, by a court to determine whether or not there has been an affirmation or a rescission. Feel free to type it in. And if you've nailed this, some of these concepts like objective, subjective, put it in the toolkit, bring it along next week because your colleagues will be really keen to know what you think. I'm not taping next week's session, so you know you can make as many mistakes as you like. The consensus is objective. And I'll, that's what I had in mind as well. Now, when the court determines these things, there are other factors that come into mind. And because a party wants a remedy, that doesn't always mean that they can get it when there are other factors that might affect the quality of their claim. If there's an unreasonable delay, we call latches, L-A-C-H-E-S, that will prevent rescission. In other words, if you're going to affirm or you're going to rescind, you need to do it promptly enough. And if you sit on your heels and you do nothing, then later decide to rescind, then you may, be, you may find that that rescission is determined by a court to be an unlawful um, rescission. So <clears throat> have a look at that. Um, and there's the rule in Seddon's case as well. Um, rescission is an equitable remedy. We know that. It's not a common law remedy. Rescission is equitable. And it's where the court makes a decision to uphold a party having terminated a transaction. So a valid rescission can be used as a defence against another equitable claim or remedy that might be sought by your opponent. What do you think, the, if you're arguing for a successful rescission of the contract, 
What's a likely argument that your opponent may seek to advance as an equitable remedy, which is, sits at the opposite end of that? Any ideas? I know that's a bit cryptic, but I'm testing your ability to, I'll give you a further hint. You say the contract's at an end, and the other side say, no, it's on foot. Um, your rescission is, purported rescission is, invalid unlawful we want to go ahead with the contract what's the remedy that you seek when you go to the court and say court we want an order forcing them to go ahead with this contract what's that remedy called we've had some answers that are close bridget was so close bridget said performance gail said specific performance that's it Okay, so when we talk about remedies that are available to you, you'll need to have somewhere in your toolkit that has a brief description of what these are, maybe the basic rules that apply to obtaining these remedies, maybe some statutory provisions that um, provide for these remedies, or more likely some cases, even if they're examples of where courts have allowed orders for specific performance, for example, in the past. So rescission is something that might be used as a defence to a claim by the other side for specific performance. And rescission is the right to repudiate or rescind the contract that is voidable because some vitiating factor that affects consent. Now, termination is different to rescission. Termination represents a point where the contract has ended. So the contract might end through performance. And we'll be talking about these things later in the unit. Or it might come to an end by agreement, um, you know, a release or a waiver, or it might come to an end as a result of the party's liabilities under the contract being discharged, absolutely. So you bring a contract to an end through termination if you're not rescinding due to some vitiating factor that affects consent. I know it's a bit technical. I, I really want you to read that, see if you can get a good idea of the difference between some of these terms, because whilst some can be used interchangeably, others have, if you like, a particular legal meaning, and you need to be able to apply the meaning correctly at the right stage at the right time. Now, termination of a contract at common law is an area that you probably need to be on top of. So a party may terminate a contract if there's a breach of an essential term or a sufficiently serious breach of a non-essential term or a repudiation by the other party. Gosh, what does all that mean? In contract A, did you undertake some study about the difference between essential terms, warranties, conditions, non-essential terms. Did we do some of that? All right. Well, look, put it this way, some terms in a contract are more important than others. And I guess that probably makes sense. You know, some are absolutely essential. Others may not be essential, but there might be, there might be a breach which is really quite serious of that particular term. Um, now, in real estate contracts, typically time is of the essence, but assume, for example, you had a, a provision um, or a contract where time was not of the essence. Um, to give you some ideas, if the contract provided that you had to pay $500,000 for the property and you only paid $400,000, you'd probably say that's a breach of an essential term. Um, if someone turned up a day late, you may say that's not an essential term, but it, because of what happened, it's become a serious breach of a non-essential term. They're not great examples, but they're the best ones I can think of on the spot. But the point is that you need to understand that a termination may occur where there's a breach of an essential term or a serious breach of a non-essential term. There are two things. The third that I've mentioned is this, where there is a repudiation of the contract by the other party. 
Does anyone know what I mean by repudiation? What does it mean? If you, said, if you argue that the other side have repudiated the contract, what does that really mean in English? Anyone tell me? No takers yet. I know I'm asking you lots of difficult questions. If a party basically says through words or actions, I'm not going ahead with this contract, then the other side is entitled to say, well, you've repudiated the contract. You've made it clear you're not going ahead. In those circumstances, the innocent party yet renounces their obligation. The innocent party is in then entitled to terminate the contract based on the repudiation of the contract by the other party. Now, non-essential terms, as I mentioned, can be important. And if a party commits a breach of a non-essential term, it may give rise to termination at common law. And here's a really important case. Here's one that I want you to have ready at your disposal. It's Kumpatu. K-O-O-M-P-A-H-T-O-O, -O -O, Local Aboriginal Land Council against Sandpine, S-A-N-P-I-N-E, citation 2007-233-CLR-115. And in compared to the High Court said to allow termination on that basis of a breach of a non-essential term, the court has to be satisfied that this was an obligation of basic importance. And um, that's kind of the, the argument that you might use or be involved in when it comes to dealing with answers to legal problems around this. So repudiation therefore can go beyond breach of essential terms. It can be the serious breaches of non-essential terms. And it might be something that's an anticipatory breach, which is the um, aspect of repudiation. So if a party says, uh, okay. I'm, on the web for the Siri. Siri was wanting to say something. Um, if the court says, um, if a party basically says, I'm not willing or I'm not able to proceed with this contract, then you may have um, a Kumpatu type argument to justify your termination. Now, the, an affected party does, does not have an obligation to accept a repudiation or and terminate the contract. In other words, if the party, if one of the parties repudiates, then the innocent party doesn't have to accept that repudiation. But they can say, I regard that as a repudiation. And on termination of the contract, the innocent party is not obliged to further terminate, uh, to perform rather the contract, but rights in the contract remain as accrued until the termination. And the innocent party can pursue damages at that stage. So rescission is equitable in terms of a remedy, and it applies where the contract is void or voidable and the remedy requires restoration of the parties to the position they are in before the contract was signed. And a party may have the ability to terminate or to rescind. So when you're going through your work, pay particular notice of the words that are used, the distinctions between these things, have some cases that support various propositions and try to think to yourself, how am I going to identify what is the key concept and therefore the key phrase or legal term that applies to this particular situation? And it's not always obvious. And of course, when we're asking a question in an exam setting, we try to make it a little tricky, a little ambiguous. I know we've covered a lot so far and thank you so much for your patience. Are there any questions for the moment? Otherwise, I have to keep going.
you have to keep listening. All right. Recision is what we mean ab initio. So the remedy of rescission doesn't just end the contract, it involves unraveling the contract and returning the parties to the position they were in before they went into the contract. So that's rescission. And ideally, neither party should benefit, uh, and neither party should suffer as a result of the misrepresentation. But once the contract has been rescinded, then the further order obligations and don't exist because it's as if the contract never existed in the first place. And in order, therefore, to have rescission as a remedy, it must be possible to return the parties to their original position before they commence the contract. So you've got to ask yourself that question. And this is where the flow charts are really useful because they help set all this out. Um, courts are flexible. In this regard, have a look at the case of Alati, A L A T I, against Kruger, 1955, 94 CLR 216. Person sold a fruit business, made misrepresentations about the takings. When it became clear that that was the case, the buyers sought rescission. In the, in the meantime, the business had declined and stopped operating but the court still allowed rescission and focused on returning the parties to where they were before it all started even though the seller couldn't get the fruit shop back it had gone by that stage uh, now as i mentioned uh, um, you can't argue rescission if you've already aff affirmed so sergeant against asl developments is the key area in that case now, the other limitation is the delay, operating and making decisions in a reasonable time. So unreasonable delay, which is the latches that I mentioned earlier, will prevent rescission. So please remember that. And then there's damages. So the second form of damages, a remedy that's available is um, damages and think about fraudulent or negligent misrepresentation in that regard. And think about when damages are available because sometimes damages can sit alone as a sole remedy. Other times damages can sit in conjunction with other remedies or in addition to other remedies. So when damages are available, they can be awarded in addition to rescission. Oh, you've been patient. So I'm proposing to leave it at that. Um, but I will ask you to do this. As you're reading the material this week, amongst all the things that I've mentioned tonight, please consider and be able to distinguish between some of the aspects and the words that we've used. Another one is you need to distinguish between precision, damages in tort, and damages in contract. When do they apply? When do they sit? When are they mutually exclusive, etc.? And we'll pick up on that next time I'm leading the talk, which will be probably me to camera. So, um, so just to repeat that, try to distinguish amongst other things between rescission and damages in tort and damages in contract. When do they work together? When are they mutually exclusive, etc.? All right. Any questions before we wrap up for this evening? All good. Shell shocked, but all good. All right. Thank you. Um, next week, I'll be in the background. Um, so please think about how you can contribute. And ideally, you'll turn up next week with something to offer and if you don't that's okay um, maybe you can engage in the process on the run all the best and we'll see you then bye